Please come closer. We are privileged tonight to have two people here whom you've seen before. And uh, I know them both very well because I send them a lot of patients. So, you know, some patients. Not working. Not working, I'm sorry. It's working. It's working. It's working. working. I will try and get closer. Try it now. Try it now, okay. Good. Uh, are you going to speak first? I'll go first. Oh, you got your stuff up there. Okay. First, we have Dr. Beth Siegel, who is the Director of the Breast Services at New York Presbyterian Queens. And a couple of you actually know her personally already, uh, as some of you know Dr. Kaplan too. Um, she's going to talk about the advantages of breast cancer. I remember when I was a student and resident, we really couldn't do very much. We could uh, do surgery, and it usually was very, very bad deforming surgery. And we could, could give people a medication called 5-FU, uh, which didn't work very well. That's all we had. Now we got better stuff. Here you go. Oh, okay. Which if you have any so questions, this is a uh, raise your hands and she'll call on you. And this okay. is the pointer. Wait. Okay. Good. Okay. Wait. All right. Thank. Thank you so much for the invite. Um, it's a pleasure again. Stand for the selfie. Okay. Got it. Um, so. I'm going to actually be all over the place. My, I think my part of, of tonight is easier than Dr. Kaplan's because as a surgeon, there's not an, a lot of new stuff with breast surgery, but we'll talk about it in a bit. And we're going to talk about um, pathology reports, which is usually the most confusing thing um, to people, and I'll try and um, clear up some questions. Um, so bottom line, though, is you got to start out, for most patients, with getting a screening mammogram. And in this country, screening starts at 40. And so starting at 40, women should get yearly mammograms. And usually, um, when we're in our 40s, which was a long time ago for me, um, our breast tissue is very, very dense. And what we have found is that what we've been doing is, um, in addition to mammography, we've been sending women with breast, dense breast tissue for something called screening ultrasounds. And the... Uh, uh, federal law now is that radiology facilities do have to report to a, to the patient when their breast tissue is dense. Uh, and so I would say if you if you get a report back that says you have dense breast tissue, uh, sometimes the report will say you might benefit from screening ultrasound. I would say probably pursue it. Uh, every now and then in women with dense breast tissue, we will find um, small cancers, which we just don't see on mammo, and that's the benefit. The risk, or the, I'm going to say the downside of it, I'm not going to say the risk, the downside of it is that ultrasound is very sensitive, but not specific. So it picks up a lot of stuff, uh, which we end up chasing a bit, and we see a lot of things on ultrasound which look benign, and then it kind of ties our hands a bit, and we end up having to do a lot of six-month follow-ups on ultrasound. Um, and as well, we end up having to um, biopsy a lot of things just to make sure uh, that things are benign. Uh, having said that, uh, in the United States, however, probably over 80% of the biopsies that are done are benign. The vast majority of time, if you have um, a screening mammogram or ultrasound and there's an abnormality, uh, the vast majority of time that biopsy should be done with a needle. Um, as, as far as diagnosis. And um, once the rules are that if you have a mammogram or an ultrasound and it shows an abnormality and you do a needle biopsy, if the findings are benign, then usually what we do is a six month follow up uh, mammogram or ultrasound. If there's any abnormality on pathology, other than cancer, other than the, than the obvious cancer or precancer, um, those abnormalities have to be removed or just excised. Not as a lumpectomy, but as what we refer to as excisional biopsy. Uh, the reason why is sometimes you get pathologies, um, uh, one of them that, that's very common is, is something called atypia, atypical ductal hyperplasia. And that means that some of the cells are starting to change. That has to be excised. And when you excise it, as scary as it is, when a patient comes in 
and they'll have, they will have had a core biopsy, and the core again shows atypia. If you excise it, over 80% of the time, those findings are actually benign. And that's how we come up with, in this country again, that the vast majority of time, uh, the findings are benign. Um, I just have to also say that mammography, ultrasound, MRI, there is no test, even if you put them all together, which is 100%. And so if you feel something, if one feels something, which is different for you, um, even with a negative mammogram and or a negative ultrasound, that has to be evaluated. And usually if you feel something abnormal in your breasts, um, usually it should have a needle biopsy. Um, what's normal and abnormal? Well, I don't know. There's no, there's no standard of what's normal or abnormal. It's really what's different for you. And so my normal may not be your normal, but anything that's different um, needs to be evaluated. So when these biopsies are not benign, when they're uh, after an excision or on a core biopsy, if there's either a precancer, which is referred to as ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, or a cancer, uh, intervention is, is needed. On ductal carcinoma in situ, we also refer to it as precancer or stage zero. And surgically, those patients can either have lumpectomy, and most of the time radiation is indicated, or a mastectomy if there's a lot of it in the breast. Uh, the prognosis on these patients is excellent. What we usually quote is survival rates of 98 to 99% because we can't say 100% on anything. Most of the time, if you're doing a lumpectomy on ductal carcinoma in situ, you do not have to take out lymph nodes. So the next one is the invasive cancer. And I'm also gonna, I'm gonna say not all breast cancers are alike. And that's really what I wanna focus on a little bit tonight what we, when somebody has an invasive breast cancer, and again, it doesn't mean it's invading, it's just, it's terminology. Um, but invasive breast cancer, um, one second, sorry, okay. Invasive breast cancers, we like to subdivide, or it has to be sub subdivided into something called estrogen receptor and or progesterone receptor, positive or negative. And that's usually what, when I, when we diagnose a breast cancer and we send the patient to a medical oncologist, really what they want to know is, is it ERP or positive or negative? And one other thing we'll look at. But when it's estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive, that means that the cells, the tumor cells, need estrogen in the environment to grow. So it's like a plant needs water, this tumor needs estrogen. And so part of the management, systemically, meaning how do we, how does the medical oncologist try and prevent this from recurring in a distant site, is to give the patient an anti-hormone. So again, these lesions like hormones, the medical oncologist is going to prescribe something which acts like an anti-hormone, either by blocking something called the, est the estrogen receptor or stopping the production of estrogen. And generally, it's better to be hormone receptor positive. Now, the no-brainer is that, again, if somebody is hormone receptor positive, they get an anti-estrogen. But some of those patients, in addition, need chemotherapy. And some of those patients, this is the HER2, it should be in the center, I'm sorry. And I'm also sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm freezing, that's why I'm wearing my jacket. But, um, uh, some of them are this thing called HER2 positive, which Dr. Kaplan, I'm sure, is going to get into a lot in a much smarter way than I can. But in somebody who is HER2 positive, those, positive, those patients need a medication called Herceptin, and the generic name for this is Trastuzumab. What does HER stand for? Pardon me? What does HER stand HER2 is human epidermal growth factor, human epidermal receptor, or human epidermal growth factor. Should um, read, they should read Dr. Love's book. They should. They should. They should. She's, she's great. Yes. She's a good friend. Um, and it's very understandable. It's a very readable book, Dr. Susan Love's Breast Book, which is called Dr. Susan Love's Breast Book. Um, anyway, um, 
I'm going to backtrack a little bit. When we think about breast cancer, you have to think about it in terms of being a local disease and how we treat the patient locally, meaning what are we doing to the breast, and a systemic disease. How is the medical oncologist going to prevent this from coming back someplace else? And locally, there are only two operations. It's either lumpectomy or mastectomy. And most lumpectomies get radiation. And most mastectomies do not. Some mastectomies do. But then systemically, what does the medical oncologist do with this information? The estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, and the HER2. Um, that directs the medical oncologist as far as prescribing or recommending anti-hormone medication, if it's indicated, or Herceptin or chemo. Herceptin works best with chemo. So if somebody is HER2 positive, they need chemo. If somebody is estrogen and progesterone receptor negative, they don't get an anti-hormone because it's not, it's not going to do any good. Those patients automatically, if the lesion is at least five millimeters, need chemo. Um, this, uh, this past Friday, I, I, my parents live in Brooklyn, so I got out early enough I could get there. For, I, I, Took me an hour and a half to get actually from Queens to Brooklyn because it's crazy going into Brooklyn on a Friday. I get there and my mother always cuts out articles for me from the Jewish press. And so this, um, so she always gives me a bunch of articles. So this past, this past uh, Friday when I get there, she says, I have an article for you and it says breakthrough in breast cancer. So I'm thinking, what's, what's the breakthrough? I knew what the breakthrough was going to be. And the breakthrough isn't exactly a breakthrough. Um, it has to do with this thing called oncotype DX. I'm just going to um, pass around three stacks of paper because um, these are actually reports, actual reports on patients without their names. Um, but I wanted to show you what the report looks like because this was, you know, in all the newspapers and the news and channel everything about this new breakthrough. It's not so new, but I did want to explain it if everyone wants to just pass those around. Um, but basically, if you have a patient who is estrogen receptor positive, so that's good, and that patient we know is going to get an anti-hormone. Some of them need chemotherapy and some don't. And up until about 10 years ago, there were a lot of more patients who were getting chemotherapy until we, a, a company uh, came up with this thing called Oncotype DX, which is a gene assay, 21 genes. And that gives you a recurrence score. And that recurrence score basically breaks down the patients who are hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. Because remember, if you're hormone receptor positive, um, you may get away just with, with an anti-hormone. If you're HER2 positive, you automatically need chemo. So you don't do oncotype on someone who's HER2 positive and you don't do oncotype on someone who is estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor negative, because they also automatically get chemo. If I lose anybody, just at, you know, scream out. Um, but this was like a big deal the last week or so, and oncotype has been around for actually probably at least 10 years, except that the new breakthrough was that they reworked the numbers. And so what the numbers, what the oncotype is, is it's a score, it's a number. And if you have a, this is one time when you want a low score. So you want to be low. And so if you have on one of those, it's three different sheets. So one of the patients there has a score of one. So if you have a score of one, and there are three different categories, there's low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And so on the low risk, if you have a, a low number, and on that original, on the original study, that low number was anything 18 or less. What that told us was that there's no benefit to chemo over hormones. If you had a high number, which was over 23 or 24, that meant that even if your hormone receptors, your ER and PR, are strongly positive or too negative, that you have that that there is a benefit to chemo. Well, this new study, this breakthrough, was in that intermediate, if you see the intermediate score, which is 
between 19 and 20 something, we didn't know what to do. That was the question. So, okay, what do you do with the intermediates? Do they need chemo? Do they not need chemo? And so the breakthrough, the study that just came out, looked at over 10,000 women, and basically it reworked the numbers um, that are probably still a little confusing to all of us. Um, but the numbers are a little different. But, but Oncotype has been around a long time, and if anything, probably a lot more women are not undergoing chemotherapy. But that's been going on for easily 10 years because of Oncotype. Is it an exact science? No, medicine is not, it's, it's not an exact science. There's the science to it, there's the art to it. And you have to look at the whole patient. You look at age, part of this, part of the study was menopausal status, part of it is are the nodes positive or negative. So it's not a slam dunk on anything. Um, and so that was the Oncotype score. And that's really what I wanted to talk about tonight, only because that's what's getting most, you know, most press, press uh, the last week or so. Um, and again, not so new. Um, but I have a lot of patients calling and saying, you know, do I really need chemo? And the answer is yes, for whatever reason. And for the ones who are, again, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, for the most part postmenopausal, um, we automatically do an oncotype. And again, all, all that happened this last time on this last study um, was that the numbers were tweaked a little bit. Again, medicine, not an exact science. I think my next slide um, is just one big question mark, um, which uh, leaves time for questions, but I think what we're gonna do is probably have Dr. Um, Kaplan speak and then we could both take questions. Any questions about, the, the, this is actually what I passed out. Those are the actual reports that we get. And so you could see where the lines are um, and, and what the recurrence score is, and it tells you what the risk of recurrence is um, at, um, at five years with, with, it says tamoxifen, but it would really be with any anti-hormonal medications, whether or not it's tamoxifen, which has been around over 40 years, or one of the class of drugs called aromatase inhibitors. I don't know if anybody's on any of that stuff here. Arimidex. Arimidex, um, letrozole, exemestane, aromacin, and astrozole, generic, brand, whatever, but all of those. Anyway, I think my next, yeah, the next one is my question mark, but I'm gonna um, have Dr. Kaplan take over, who has a harder job. Oh, I'll take questions then. I will take questions. Questions? Anybody? Anything? Did I totally confuse everybody?